Hello, my name is Michael Kahn. I'm an Irrigation and Water Resources Advisor for UC Cooperative Extension and I'm located in Monterey County. Unlike much of California, the Central Coast doesn't have an ample supply of surface water and we don't rely on water transfers from the Central Valley Project. Instead, we're very much self-reliant on groundwater in our region. This is the area where much of the cool season vegetable production occurs. We rely on storm water, um, capturing of storm water during winter uh, storm events into reservoirs like Lake San Antonio or Lake Nascimento in the mountains, the coastal mountains in Monterey County. Currently, uh, both of these reservoirs are, are at very low capacity. We rely on these um, lakes to um, release water into the Salinas River and recharge our groundwater supplies. As you can see, Lake San Antonio at 4% capacity in the winter has very little water uh, to resupply our aquifers. This is data from the Monterey County Water Resource Agency showing groundwater levels in the Salinas aquifer. This is at the east side of the Salinas uh, Basin and the uh, pink uh, value here, uh, uh, symbols here, represent the groundwater levels for 2013. The blue line here represents uh, the current conditions and these open squares up here are in a, a normal water year which was established in 1985 and these uh, open circles represent the 1991 drought year. As you can see, groundwater levels have dropped uh, in the Salinas Basin and are now below the 1991 drought conditions. Although the Salinas aquifer and many of the aquifers on the Central Coast have a, a lot of capacity, the problem is when we overpump, it aggravates the problem of seawater intrusion into the groundwater supply. And this is a map on the coast near the Monterey Bay and shows the boundary of seawater intrusion into the aquifer at the 180 foot depth. As you can see, we've made a lot of progress in stopping seawater intrusion in the last uh, few years but over pumping during a drought because we'd have less rainfall for uh, establishing our crops um, and we have less uh, recharge to the groundwater will aggravate uh, seawater intrusion. The production of cool season vegetables usually requires ample supply of irrigation water because uh, production, yield, quality, is all affected by moderate deficits in soil moisture and these can cause uh, significant yield loss. As a consequence, growers are generally quite liberal with their irrigation of these, these commodities. In addition to uh, water conservation, there is an interest to also uh, protect water quality. When growers uh, apply too much water during a single irrigation, they get runoff or excessive tile drainage uh, as that water percolates into tile drainage lines. That water uh, affects water quality because it carries uh, both phosphorus and nitrogen into surface water supplies. And currently, uh, growers throughout the Central Coast face um, uh, very stiff water quality re regulations, both federal and state regulations. And so there are total maximum daily load uh, regulations for nutrients in both the Pajaro, Salinas, and Santa Maria basins. Also, uh, state law under the Ag Order or the Waste Discharge uh, uh, Waiver will require growers to be more diligent in reducing nitrate leaching. The situation in the production of cool seeds and vegetables is that um, there's usually a number of uh, rotations uh, through the season of vegetable crops. And each vegetable requ crop requires significant inputs of nitrogen fertilizer. 
Also, uh, a lot of the crop is um, left behind after harvest as residue, and there can be as much as 60 to 70 pounds of nitrogen per acre that remains in a field as residue. Over the season, the soil nitrate levels um, increase, and when there's a significant irrigation or in the winter rainfall event, that nitrate leaches because many of these crops that we grow are very shallow rooted. And this slide just shows that the, the average rooting depth of uh, head lettuce about three weeks before a harvest is about 12 inches. So once uh, water moves uh, down below the root zone carrying nitrate, it's out of the reach of the root zone. So both for both um, water conservation purposes and for protecting water quality, it is really uh, imperative growers look at their irrigation practices. And uh, one of the places to start is looking at how uniform these irrigation systems apply water. This is an example of uh, buckets measuring the uniformity of a sprinkler irrigation in the Salinas Valley in lettuce. And what we evaluate is if we get similar amounts of water depths in each of these buckets. And we calculate a uniformity distribution. This is a good idea to check on uh, as a, a first step to figure out if you can irrigate more efficiently. When the uniformity is very high, you can apply less water. For example, if a grower is trying to apply a half an inch of water to the crop and they have a very high uniformity, say 90% uniformity, this means they only need to apply a little bit more than a half an inch uh, to get uh, a half an inch in the driest area of their field. If their irrigation system has a low uniformity, say a 50% uniformity, then they need to apply about an inch to make sure the driest quarter of the field gets a half inch of water. So when they have to apply an inch of water, this means in some areas of the field, they're over applying. They will either uh, result in runoff or deep percolation, which will leach nitrate and they're pumping more water, so that's also um, depleting the, the aquifer. A good idea is to have a, a professional evaluate your irrigation system performance, both uniformity and evaluate um, whether it's well maintained and designed. And they should be able to develop a report which points out specific um, actions that need to be taken to improve that irrigation system uniformity and performance. Many growers on the Central Coast and growers of, of cool season vegetables have been, have been converting to drip irrigation to try to improve the irrigation um, efficiency. Some of the potential advantages of drip are that it reduces evaporative losses and runoff because you're not applying water into the furrows where the crop isn't planted. It also can potentially improve irrigation uniformity. Unlike sprinklers, it's not affected by wind, and there's an opportunity to improve the timing of fertilizer applications because you can inject fertilizer directly into the drip system and apply this fertilizer at rates that match the crop uptake. Drip is now commonly used on a wide variety of cool season vegetables, uh, ranging from coal crops such as cauliflower and broccoli to lettuce and uh, fennel and, and peas and celery. Question is, how uniformly is water applied in cool season vegetables? During 2009 through 2012, we have evaluated both drip and sprinkler irrigated uh, vegetable fields in the Salinas Valley and in the Pajaro Valley. We find the average distribution uniformity for sprinklers in low wind conditions was about 66 percent. 
66% is quite a bit below uh, a perfect uniformity, which would be 100%. And the, the range in uniformity was from 50 to 86%. So we had some fields quite low in, in terms of uniformity. Under DRIP, uh, we see an average uniformity of 78%, certainly better than sprinklers, but a bit below what can be achieved uh, in a good, uh, well-managed uh, drip system that's well-designed and uh, well-maintained. Uh, industry standard for drip is about 85% uniformity. And you can see that some growers did achieve very high uniformities, as high as 96%, but some fields were very poor uniformity, 23%. With drip, getting the pressure right is really critical. In a field that we evaluated for uh, drip uniformity, we looked at the, the uh, um, pressure at different regions of the field. And this graph is showing, uh, with each symbol, a different area of the field we evaluated. And the pressure ranged from 4 to 8 psi. Um, we also measured the emission rate from the tape. And that ranged from uh, 0.25 gallons per minute per 100 feet of tape length to 0.35. Now this may not seem like a significant difference in amount of water applied, but at 8 PSI, you're about 40% higher in the application rate than at 4 PSI. This means more water is going on in certain areas of the field and also more nutrients when you're applying uh, uh, nitrogen fertilizer. There are some sp specific issues with uh, drip irrigation in cool season vegetables. Remembering that these crops are short term, 60 to 70 days, uh, to make drip economical, the tape is retrieved after each crop is produced. This means uh, we use our tape for 8 to 12 crops before it's uh, recycled or disposed of. And over time, the tape may be a mixture of ages and quality. It uh, has uh, leaks sometimes, and so they're spliced together. But these splices often themselves leak. One way irrigators uh, compensate uh, for these leaks is they lower the pressure of the submain of the system. And as the pressure gets lower in these irrigation systems, the uniformity gets worse. This uh, graph is just showing the average pressure of 11 irrigation systems that were evaluated. And you can see when the average pressure of, air, of a drip system is less than 6 psi, this is when we're getting some of the lowest uniformities. As irrigation uniformity uh, decreases in drip, then you would imagine that when we're applying fertilizers through the drip system, the fertilizer application uniformity would be reduced. We evaluated in these 11 fields um, how uniform the fertilizer that was applied was distributed by putting buckets in different locations of the field with emitters. And so we could uh, monitor the total volume of water that was coming out and get an idea of the concentration and the mass uh, of, of nitrogen that was applied through the drip system and, calculating a, and calculated a uniformity. This table shows for these 11 fields uh, the, the irrigation uniformity, the application water uniformity. And you can see on average it was 73%. Some fields had very high uniformities. And as you can see, some fields had very low uniformities. Where we had low irrigation uniformity, we had low fertilizer application uniformity. And generally, where we had high um, irrigation uniformity. We had high fertilizer uniformity. There was a case like in this field uh, where we had high uh, irrigation application uniformity but the fertilizer application was still low and this was more because of a procedural issue 
the uh, grower was injecting the fertilizer at a T or a branch in the system, so part of the fertilizer uh, branched off in one direction and part in another, and that created a lower uniformity. But the main message here is without good um, application uniformity in the drip system, then the fertilizer will not go out uniformly. So here are a few uh, strategies to get high uniformity in drip systems for cool season vegetables in surface drip that uh, is um, often retrieved and reused. First, uh, consider using frequent uh, and small applications of fertilizer so that the fertilizer matches the application rate of the system. Also, make sure the irrigation system applies water uniformly and try to match the fertilizer rate with the crop uh, demand for nutrients. Usually uh, the nitrogen demand is quite low when the plants are small and it's going to increase with time. So the fertilizer rates should reflect this. And a very important part of fertigating with drip, system, drip systems is to allow sufficient time for the fertilizer to clear through the drip lines before the drip system is turned off. Uh, it takes, on average, in these 11 fields, about 45 minutes for the fertilizer to move from the point of injection to the end of the lines. A characteristic of drip tape that's reused for several crops is that it has leaks. And so it requires constant maintenance, uh, or you will have uh, a combination of sprinkler and drip together and as this, this slide is showing you, maybe a little furrow irrigation. So training your staff is really critical for good irrigation management and there should be regular trainings um, and uh, discussion of how to improve uh, the maintenance and the operation of these irrigation systems. Now I'd like to just cover some strategies for general strategies for improving irrigation water management in cool season vegetables. One of the first steps is to just look at how much water you're applying to your crops. You can use flow meters such as here where you put them on a specific irrigation block and uh, monitor through a, a whole crop cycle how much water is being applied. We often um, interface these uh, flow meters with a data logger that can record every irrigation to determine how much water is applied um, th through the different part stages of the crop cycle. Of 21 fields, lettuce fields, that we monitored, um, we found that the average amount of water that was applied to lettuce was about 13 inches. When we uh, express the amount of water applied in terms of uh, crop demand or crop ET, we find that uh, the range was from 100% of the crop water demand all the way up to 300% and averaged out at around 180% of crop ET. This means once we're applying more than 100% of crop ET, there is extra water that would be available for uh, percolation and leaching of nitrate or for runoff. And it does show that at least some of these fields, there's potential to conserve water with better water management. One of the um, potential uh, practices that can really be looked at for reducing water use in cool season vegetables is in establishing the stand, whether it's for um, germination or for transplanting but particularly for, for germination. You can see of these 21 fields that we monitored, about a third to half of the water that was applied was for uh, stand establishment. And in all cases, this is for germinating seed. As much as uh, eight inches of water were being applied in some fields and even more. Generally, uh, between three to four inches of water should be sufficient uh, in normal conditions for germinating up a lettuce crop. 
The use of transplants is one way to, to reduce the amount of water for stand establishment, and in a drought it might make sense. It also shortens uh, the growing season and, and also will reduce the amount of water that's applied uh, through the whole crop cycle. Some growers are also looking in drip establishment of their vegetable crops, both seeded as well as transplanted uh, crops. With uh, transplanted crops, this is a quite uh, normal way of establishing a, a crop, or they might use some supplemental overhead irrigation for one or two irrigations. For seeded crop, uh, this requires really the right soil type. Um, the advantage of of, of using drip for establishment is that it eliminates sprinklers and uh, it of course will eliminate runoff as long as the drip system is not leaking. Uh, by eliminating sprinklers, uh, growers only using one type of irrigation system so they can reduce their costs. But the soil has to be the right type uh, to do this because the drip system is usually um, uh, injected about two or three inches below the soil surface so the water has to move up to the surface and into the seed line to successfully uh, germinate. Another opportunity to reduce uh, water use is often um, when the crop is still small but it is established and uh, often the crop is thinned at this stage and so there's very little evapotranspiration at this point, but soil nitrate levels can often be high because the growers often uh, do their first sidrus application with nitrogen. The roots are concentrated in very shallowly in the upper foot of soil. A large irrigation event is going to leach a lot of that nitrogen. Since the crop hasn't used a lot of water, um, up to this point, the soil is almost saturated, so it's very easy to exceed the water holding capacity of the soil. So irrigation events that are more than about 0.6 or 3 quarters of an inch in the amount of water applied are going to lead to, to leaching, and this is an opportunity where growers could reduce some of that nitrate loss. Another frequent concern of growers using drip is uh, they irrigate to try to get that lateral movement of moisture out to uh, the plant row. And although this uh, looks like the water is not moving out to the plant row or just getting it to it, when we dig underground, we can see that uh, although the surface of the soil is dry, in fact, underneath the soil moisture has moved all the way out into the furrows and under the tape it is, is quite wet. Uh, so um, irrigating for excessive amount of times to try to move the water out to the, the plant row is often uh, one of the causes for over irrigating uh, in the early stages after thinning. Another frequent concern of growers, especially in droughts, is salinity effects on cool season vegetables. Uh, during a drought, we don't have the winter rainfall to leach out salts from the surface of the soil. And many cool season vegetables are very salt sensitive. Uh, lettuce, for example, uh, where your soil EC is above 1.3, will start to reduce um, their growth and, and yield. And when the water EC gets above uh, one decisemen per meter, uh, then uh, you would also affect uh, uh, growth of the crop. So how do you manage salinity during a, a drought? Well, consider that a lot of leaching is done uh, during the pre-irrigation events and stand establishment, as I mentioned before. And so much of the salt that would have built up over the winter is probably uh, flushed away in the, the stand establishment phase of the crop. Keep in mind that a leaching fraction is often needed when the uh, electrical conductivity or the salinity of the water uh, is high. And, um, but um, once you use a leaching fraction above about 30 or 40 percent of the crop ET, 
uh, then the EC of, of the soil is going to approach basically the EC of the water. You're never going to get the EC of the soil less than the EC of the water and adding 100% more water than the crop needs is not going to do a, a lot of good and is going to leach a lot of the nitrogen. Um, one strategy is to irrigate more frequently when you're using drip. This can offset some of the um, deleterious uh, effects of salinity on crop growth. Also, keep in mind, do not apply uh, fertilizer uh, right before a leaching event. So if you can apply extra water to leach out salts, that is not a good time to put your nitrogen fertilizer on. Now lastly, I'd like to address um, how growers could improve irrigation scheduling in cool season vegetables. And irrigation scheduling is really has two components. When, one is deciding when to irrigate, and the second is deciding how much to irrigate. As I mentioned earlier, cool season vegetables are very sensitive to deficits in soil moisture. So it makes sense to use soil moisture monitoring, no matter what type of tool you want to use, uh, to decide when to irrigate. Tensiometers are, are very common, and now there are many types of volumetric soil moisture sensors. But using uh, a shovel or a soil probe is also quite effective. I like tensiometers uh, because they monitor the tension of the soil and essentially they monitor uh, how difficult it is for the roots to pull the water from the soil. And this is a measurement of soil moisture that is most related to uh, water status in the plant. And no matter which texture soil you're on, um, the tension that you're measuring has the same significance to plant water status. For uh, lettuce, for example, in the early stages, the tension that would trigger an irrigation would be somewhere between 30 and 40 centibars. For some crops, like broccoli, uh, they're often um, allowed to dry down much more than in lettuce. And so tensiometers have a limit of measuring tension to 80 centibars, but you can use something like granular matrix blocks um, as shown in this slide, to monitor uh, tension to, to levels as high as uh, 190 uh, centibars of tension. And these uh, granular matrix blocks have the advantage that they can be uh, attached to data loggers such as this one, which can graph um, the tension over time. And in the field, a, a user can see this. While soil moisture monitoring is, is really useful for telling you when to irrigate, it's less useful for telling you how much water to irrigate. So uh, in the last few years, we have looked at whether we can use uh, climate data or weather data to determine how much to water a crop. And in particularly, we're using the CIMIS weather network. CIMIS is the California Irrigation Management and Information System is operated by the Department of Water Resources, and it consists of a network of weather stations uh, throughout the, all the agricultural areas of, of California, and there are about 140 stations. Uh, what a SIMA station is measuring is over a reference crop, which is uh, here shown as grass, evapotranspiration, which is calculated from solar radiation, relative humidity, air temperature, and wind speed. The CIMIS data is available on the World Wide Web from the CIMIS website. And uh, you can arrange to have uh, the data from the particular station you're interested in uh, emailed to you uh, on a daily basis. Uh, to use CIMIS information, the ET data is a reference ET based on uh, a well-watered grass. For the crop of interest, you need to multiply it by a crop coefficient, which can vary from as little as 0.1 to 1.2 when you're at um, uh, the maximum canopy size. 
With lettuce, it can be very tricky uh, to use ET information because the canopy is often very small in the early stages of growth and then rapidly increases. So it uh, follows this sigmoidal shaped curve and you can see much of the change in canopy is between 20 and uh, 60 days. And this means calculating a crop coefficient can be quite difficult for growers. To make it easier, we have developed an online program called Crop Manage that can really facilitate uh, the calculations of crop ET for uh, lettuce and other cool season vegetables. Now just to summarize, uh, some of the main irrigation strategies for optimizing production and protecting water quality include assuring that the irrigation system has a high uh, distribution uniformity, minimize irrigation water for stand establishment, and this is usually by uh, applying a little less water with each of the irrigations or uh, converting over to transplants. Um, Try to avoid irrigations that exceed the water holding capacity of the soil, especially when the crop has a very small canopy and uh, has low evapotranspiration. Use best practices for fertigating so you get that fertilizer uh, evenly distributed. And of course, avoid heavy irrigations right after uh, fertilizing with nitrogen. And try to match the irrigation schedule with the crop water requirement and uh, using evapotranspiration data can be a good guide. Thank you.